Well, good morning to you all. I'm just letting you know that I'm profoundly depressed that I don't live in the Midwest. <laughs> they were blessed with snow, but it's coming, it's coming. I want to let you know something else, that one of the signs of maturity, one of the signs of maturity is the use of bifocal glasses. I don't know that because I don't have them. I'm blind across the whole distant spectrum, you see. <laughs> but I've been told that bifocal glasses are great. Just a show of hands, how many of you have bifocals? There's a few of them around, just like that, see? And I also understand there are progressives and there are trifocals and there's, I haven't heard about quadfocals, but you know how this works. But the purpose of a bifocal lens is to be able to see both up close and far away. You're with me, correct? I think that's what they tell me. I haven't figured that out yet, but that's what they tell me, up close and far away. And the reason for that is because our vision often gets distorted and we can't see both sides. Now, lest you think this is an age thing, my uh, grandson, Finn, who's in second grade, he also needs bifocals. We don't know which ancestor to blame it on, but we, the, the odds are out there. You know how that works. So bifocals are a necessity depending on a whole variety of factors. And I'm using that as an introduction because what I suggest that Matthew does in, in Matthew chapter 18 is give us a bifocal perspective on seeing not just Jesus, but Jesus' people. Matthew switches gears a little bit by helping us understand what kind of particular people are his kingdom people. Last week, Gary helped us understand something of the greatness of Jesus. He's the king who is glorious. He's transfigured on the mount. His, 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 his clothing is bright as the sun. And then they come down the mountain, and he's also good. He's the king who mess, takes care of the messes that his disciples have. Remember the disciples at the bottom can't exercise the demon of this man who brings his son. And he graciously says to him, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with you guys, but I'm going I'm to help you out anyway. And not only is he good, but he's gracious. And at the very end, he pays a tax for the temple tax that will basically grease the skids for the very process that will result in his crucifixion. He's a gracious, good, and glorious king. In our text this morning, the focus shifts from the character of Jesus to the character and conduct of his followers. And there are four lessons that highlight the way in which Jesus, our view of Jesus helps the way we're supposed to look. First of all, verses 1 to 9, how we see ourselves. Verses 10 to 14, how we see others, how we are to seek them out. Verses 15 to 20, how we are to show others faults when people wrong us. And finally, verses 21 to 35, how we are to settle accounts. How often do you forgive? Follow along, I'm reading Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them and said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, Whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that caused people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to ha and have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds the, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. 
If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Textual note. It could also read 70 times seven. Oh, I thought I had it down, you know. Verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, the man who owned him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to pay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now, if you have your praise and prayer sheet, you'll have to recognize that these four lessons come on the idea of vision that takes place, that Jesus exemplifies here. And you note that each one has a kind of bias or a tendency associated with it. Seeing ourselves correctly means that we ought to have a bias toward humility. We'll speak about this in a little bit. Seeking others compassionately is a bias toward home. What ought to happen that makes us happy? We have a bias to the one to bring people home who have wandered away. Thirdly, we are to show others what hurts us constructively. There's a bias toward honesty. You don't let evil go unchecked. And finally, we are to settle accounts cooperatively from the heart. We have a bias to not just do lip stuff, but to do it with our whole being. First of all, how should we see each other? It's fascinating that the lessons here come out of the context of what's happening last week, last uh, the chapter before. And Gary helped us a whole lot about that. And I want to speculate with you why this question comes. Why does the disciples come to Jesus and say, who's the greatest in the king? Who's top dog, Jesus? I want to say that one of the things could be that three disciples went up to the Mount of Transfiguration and the nine stayed back home. So there's always within the Christian community a tendency to have an in-group and an out-group, correct? And maybe what's going on is one of those people say, whoa, 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 how come they got to go and we didn't? And the revelation of Jesus to particular people always has a tendency to marginalize folk who didn't get the same vision. Or it could be this. Jesus came back down, and the, the nine disciples can't exercise the demon. They, they're kind of miffed about this. And Jesus then rescues them from that. And out of that context, the other three who come down saying, oh, well, we didn't have that problem. 
maybe we're the good guys and you other guys are the bad guys because you don't have enough faith. Of course, that never happens at Grand Bible Chapel. I'll just let you know that. We're, we're talking about other people, not us. Okay. <laughs> just a clue phone here. Okay. Or it could be that Jesus, as Gary mentioned last week, talks about this idea of a temple tax. And he makes the analogy that kings and kings' sons, they don't have to pay the tax because they're the ones that levy the tax. And maybe they misunderstood Jesus' analogy. And basically they're saying, we're all pretty hot shot stuff. Are we the greatest in the kingdom? It's against that backdrop of trying to figure out where you stand, what your status is within the communities of God's people that Jesus uses this stark contrast. And he says that kingdom greatness is characterized by, first of all, humility. He takes a little boy and places them in the midst of them and says this, unless you become like a little child, you never see the kingdom of heaven. Now, a little bit of background here. You understand that this is a radical kind of definition, a radical kind of metaphor. Because in the ancient world, the Greeks viewed children as kind of the tabula rasa, the blank slate. And the result was kids were only valuable according to what they could learn and repeat. Rhetoric was the big deal. In other words, kids had no intrinsic value, only what they could learn and repeat back. The Romans took it one step further, and they said it's not just what they could learn, but what they could do. And Roman education for children, particularly boys, by the way, was basically combative, competitive. And it was the powerful one that rose to the highest. So basically, if the uh, Greeks were naturalists, the Romans were pragmatists. And it's in that context that the Hebrews were kind of in the midst of a transition. They didn't quite know how to think about kids. In the ancient world, kids were seen as a blessing from God. The Old Testament said that kids have intrinsic value because they're a gift from God. But by the time Jesus is speaking, the Jewish people of the day had been co-opted by the thinking of the Greeks and the Romans. So what Jesus does in taking this little boy and putting him in the midst, saying, unless you become like this kid, you can't have any of the kingdom. Everyone's like, whoa. This is hot shot stuff. But Jesus is making the point. Children are models of kingdom people by virtue of their dependence, their delight in life unless they're abused, and their willingness to give and express emotion in the moment. They're not duplicitous. They're not hypocrites. And if that's what kids are like in their best, that's what we should be like. We are to be childlike, not childish. But Jesus goes on and says, not only are we to exemplify the best attributes of children, but we're also to recognize who they're linked with. And Jesus says, it, unless you, when you accept the kid in my name, you accept the child in my name, you receive me. Oh. In other words, Jesus links the value of children to his own person. I've always thought it interesting that probably we spend too much time thinking about what goes on in this room and not enough time thinking about what happens in the basement of the gym building. Do you understand that from the perspective of Jesus, the real action is happening in the Sunday school? <laughs> not happening here. That the way in which Jesus connects with kids means that when we receive little ones, screaming though they may be, we receive Jesus. And the third implication comes out of this. Jesus says that the reason why you need to do this is because literally heaven and hell are at stake. Be careful how you treat little ones. It would be better if you're going to hurt them to put a millstone around your neck and get drowned in the sea. Why? Because heritage is at stake. And the way in which you care for the subsequent generations has everything to do with the way in which I view history as a whole. So in this regard, Jesus uses a metaphor. It makes it a metaphor. He's not into self-mutilation, but he says, if your hand, your foot, or your eye would cause someone to sin, it's better that you don't have them because that's how valuable little kids are. He's not telling you literally to cut off your hand, your foot, or your eye, but he is saying that what you do 
where you go and what you see ought to be so disciplined so that little kids are not offended and are not dragged down. Because we are to model the kingdom work of Jesus. Uh, let me illustrate this a little bit. Uh, a couple months ago, my wife recognized with me that we had kind of lost touch with our immediate geographic neighborhood. We had known an awful lot of what was going on in the neighborhood because our kids, when they were growing up, took place in an ancient childhood vo vocation called a paper route. And most of you don't know what a paper route is, but we did. We knew more about our neighborhood than the CIA. <laughs> We knew when people went on vacation. We, I mean, they, in fact, what happened was our kids hated to collect because it took them two hours to go door to door because the old folk wanted to know what was going on, you see. But the kids grew up, and we no longer were yelling all sorts of encouragements from the sideline of swimming meets and soccer, you know, whatever. We had no way of doing that, so we lost touch with our neighborhood. Except this past fall, we made it a practice to have Caleb, my three-year-old, spend overnight with us. And so one of the things we did was we started to take walks in our neighborhood. I'm going to write a book called Travels with Caleb. Watch out, Steinbeck. You know? <laughs> but as a result of our walking with Caleb, all of a sudden we were invited to touch the spiders on Glenn Baker's Halloween thing. Oh, it was great. We were able to go up and actually see the inflatable monsters. Three-year-old sees things a little differently. We were invited by the Okos to go in their koi pond in the back and see the bullfrogs. Why? Because three-year-olds, everyone treats three-year-olds great. And guess what? I get to go along. <laughs> we went to go to a, a cross-country meet at Cutler Middle School. We met all sorts of people. Because you're with Caleb, and they're, they're watching people run. You see, the interesting thing is when you treat little kids in a certain way, you begin to see the way they see. <laughs> And instead of it limiting the opportunities of life, it expanded them for us old fuddy-duddies. And Jesus is making the same point. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as caring for people that folk would marginalize? What's your humility quotient today? Do you care for the little ones? of your world. But Jesus makes this point. It's not just how we see ourselves, but it's what we ought to do for those who have wandered away. So the second section of our text talks about how we should seek others compassionately. Jesus gives three visual motivations. The first is the angel's interest. In verse 10 he says, their angels, speaking these little ones, are always looking at their father in heaven, my father in heaven. You see what the picture is here. The little kids have an angel assigned to them, and that angel is always looking at the father to get the cue as to whether to go do something. Or in some of you, in our case, in our kids had a whole legion to help them out because they were in trouble all the time. But the point being is this. If angels are interested in what the father's attitude is toward little ones, so should we! The second point he makes is that of a shepherd's incentive. It said, you know the picture. The shepherd has 100 sheep. 99 of them are doing good. They're, they're good little doobie sheep. You know how that works. They're, they're in their fold, but one wanders off. What does the shepherd do? He leaves the 99 and has a bias toward the one that's lost. In fact, it goes even further than that. He not only goes after them, but when he finds them and brings them back, it says in the text, he's happier about the recovery of the one than he is of the 99. And unless you get it even further, he goes this way. Jesus says in verse 14, my father is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. And let me expand the idea of little one. It's not just chronologically, but it's maturity-wise. Little one can be a teenager who's trying to find their way in the world. A little one could be a 20-year-old who doesn't know how to find a job after completing education. A little one can be basically someone who is immature and is needing the care for the rest of the mature folks. It could be an elderly person that doesn't remember what's true. 
And the fact of the matter is, is both the angels, the shepherd, I think Jesus is speaking autobiographically here as him being the shepherd, and the father, you understand the triunity of what's going on in the, in the metaphor here, that the father God is of such a care that he cares for kids of all ages. And if we don't, we don't exemplify the same attitude that Jesus' peoples should have. Let me illustrate. I've been reading some of the works of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a great preacher in the mid-19th century, 1800s. He lived in England and was known as the Prince of Preachers long before modern media or technical expertise. It's estimated that Spurgeon spoke to over 10 million people during his lifetime. People wanted to know what the secret was to his success. So one intrepid reporter, after bugging Spurgeon day in, day out, finally was given an audience and invited by Spurgeon to say, I will tell you the secret of my success if you come on Sunday morning and I'm going to show you two rooms. The reporter was all excited, came with his notebook ready. And the first room that Spurgeon took him to was a boiler room below the main auditorium. And there, several hundred people were gathered to pray for the folk who were going to assemble upstairs. He says, this room is the power of my ministry. People praying concertedly for the folk that God will bring is the thing that makes this ministry work. But there's a second room I want to show you. And he brought the reporter up to his office and had him look out the window. And as he looked out the window, he says, what do you see? And the reporter says, well, I see London. I see people going about. I see a woman press, doing a stroller with her little ones. I see the life of London before me. And Spurgeon said, that's where you're wrong. I don't see London like that. I see a city going to hell unless they meet and know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's the perspective of my ministry. So Spurgeon then spoke to a series of pastors a little while later and said these words, brothers, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general until the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. It indicts me, brothers and sisters, but when you meet as small groups, when you meet in affinity groups, do you spend as much time talking to God as you do to each other? Spurgeon also said, it's a good rule never to look into the face of a man in the morning until you've looked into the face of God. You understand, friends, that the bias of the Father God, of the Shepherd's Son, and of the Spirit, represented by the angels of heaven, is toward the one who is lost, not to the general comfort of the collected whole. It's against this vision of seeing ourselves and seeking the lost that Jesus details a, a third sort of vision. We are to show faults constructively. And here the question is, well, how does that fit? Well, what was Matthew thinking? Why did he link these first two things to this idea of showing faults? Well, it's precisely this, that when lost people come back to the community of God, they bring lots of baggage. In the realm of uh, CR and their mantra, they come with hurts, hang-ups, and habits. And the fact of the matter is, is that hurt people hurt people. Do you understand what I'm saying, right? If you've been hurt, you will also hurt others. So that the folk who God's... You know, the church would be a wonderful place if there was no sinners in it. <laughs> you can all leave. I'm perfect. You know, <laughs> which just proved the point, correct? How we see and show faults, sins, and evils done to us by others is a characteristic trait of what it means to be Jesus' kinds of people. And Jesus affirms two things. First of all, we need to affirm our family status. He says, if a brother comes to you or a brother hurts you, we're family first. No matter how difficult the pain, we should recognize that we're part of the family of God, if in fact you are. 
The second thing that Jesus encourages us to do is to act to limit the fallout of difficulty, hence the four-step resolution. Go to the brother first, one-to-one. When someone hurts you and you go to them, you want a brother. If they hurt and don't hear, don't tell it to Facebook. Do you catch my drift? (laughs) Facebook's the new inversion of the prayer chain. The prayer chain, let me tell you how somebody really hurt me. Would you pray for us? You know, that's gossip. So Jesus says, limit the fallout by going one-to-one, and if that doesn't work, go two-to-one, get a couple witnesses. If it doesn't work, go to the sphere within people to understand what's going on. And if that doesn't work, Jesus says, go and treat him like you would a tax collector or a pagan. And most of us take that as a permission to shun or to shame somebody. That's not the intent at all, because who's writing these words of Jesus down in the book that we're studying? This is the gospel according to... Matthew. And what was Matthew's job? Anyone? 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 A tax collector. And how did Jesus treat him? He welcomed him home. And so should we. Oh, McCoy, you're just blowing my socks off. You mean? You mean I got to treat the people? Yeah, that's what you got to do. You mean mean they hurt me and I've still... Yeah, you got them. And, and, and you know, Bob, you're saying, but you don't know my family. Oh, Thanksgiving's going to be terrible. You know, I mean, and if we survive Thanksgiving, then there's Christmas. Oh, man, you know the holidays are coming. Oh, man. And they hurt me so bad. And what are we supposed to do? You're supposed to treat them like Jesus treated. So it's in that context that Peter comes up with the famous question about settling accounts. And he says, Lord, I want to know how what this forgiveness stuff looks like. How many do I have to do? (laughs) Seven seems like a lot, right? He wants to forgive for points, correct? Uh, I'm giving you seven. That's the perfect number. After that, I can just dismiss him, right? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. And he tells this story. He tells the story of two servants, one who owes his master Someone did the math at the end of the first service, about a half a million dollars. And the master says, you got to pay up. And if you don't pay up, I'm going to sell you and your wife and your kids and everything you got until you do pay up, indentured servitude. But the master, it says in the text, had pity on him, and he not only didn't tell him he had to pay up, he forgave the debt entirely. Then the the servant goes out and finds a fellow servant who only owes the equivalent of about a couple hundred dollars. A denarii is equal to one day's rage for a common laborer. You do the math. And this servant doesn't understand the nature of the largesse that's been shown him. He doesn't understand the grace that's been given to him. And he takes his fellow servant, shakes him, and puts him into prison for the fact that he owes him only a couple hundred bucks. And Jesus is making this point. The economics, the economy of forgiveness is that we can never pay back or grant grace to someone who's hurt us any more than what God has already shown to us. He does it daily, brothers and sisters. And the way Jesus' people are to see themselves and others is precisely in light of the great grace has been shown us. Illustration, and we close. Uh, I mentioned before that we're having fun with our grandchildren. They come to our house periodically. It's one of the ways we find out how their parents are really doing. (sighs) You see. This past Tuesday night, Caleb was overnight, and uh, we had had a good day, and he went to bed, and at 1.30 in the morning, I hear him crying. I'm blind and bald, but I got tremendous hearing, and so he comes up, and he says, don't Bebo, where's Bear? Well, bear is something that Caleb needs to do sleep. It's a little bear. And I come in, and I don't have my glasses on, and I'm going to find bear between. And it's dark. I mean, I'm, it's a search and destroy. It's just finding bear with, by Braille. You know how this is? It's 1.30 in the morning, you know? This is during the daytime, just to get the picture. You couldn't see anything. 
So we finally find Bear and put him in, and everything's well. Oh, 2 30 in the morning. I think Bear walks. <laughs> I think Bear is a Syrian refugee. You know how this works. I mean, I think this. Next time I'm going to duct tape Bear to Caleb. You know how this works. A couple times a night we lost Bear. What's the lesson of the bear? It's not that Caleb will sometime, someday think that I'm a cool grandfather who can find bear wherever he needs them. It's not that I'm learning lessons in childlikeness that I can see through the eyes of my own grandkids. Each of us have a bear. It may not be a physical one. No, 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 no. The valuable those these lessons are, the essential lesson is that God sees me in my need and wants me to see other kids, other children, other people the same way he does. And he wants me ultimately to ask the set of questions. How do you see yourself? What's your humility index? He wants us to understand something about what makes us happy. Am I more happy that one person came to Jesus this past week, which I understood took place in one of the Iwana clubs? That should charge us more than whether the Patriots will win today. He wants us to understand that we're called to be a holy community, showing others faults and seeking resolution that our bias is toward family and home. And ultimately, he wants us to have a bias toward doing things with authenticity, heart, not just rote. Let's pray together. Lord, you've heard your word read. We ask that the self-same spirit that inspired Matthew to write these words and Jesus to speak them would by your spirit come into our hearts and drive them home, both in the way we think and the way we act. Lord, if there are folk in this room who are on the way seeking you, would you help us to be people who bring them into the wonder of your family? Thank you for this word and this time. We pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people will say,